Welcome to Spoken in Justice, where we put the criminal justice system in the dock. In today's video, we will focus on the different approaches that have been taken by the police in assessing criminal complaints, particularly in relation to sexual offences cases, and why it is important that both police and prosecutor maintain an impartial and open mind approach throughout investigations and prosecutions. We will also see how our findings apply equally to criminal complaints other than sexual offences complaints. So follow us until the end as we, as usual, provide you with facts, not opinions. First, by way of background, this video was inspired by the many concerning posts in various social media platforms shouting out polar opposite messages. On one side, many, mostly women, claiming to have been sexually assaulted and their claims ignored by police. And on the other, many, mostly men, claiming to have been falsely accused and even convicted of sexual offences that they did not commit. We have been left puzzled as to how this is possible. How can there be falsely accused when claims are not being pursued by the police? How can there be real claims when many claim to have been falsely accused or convicted? Something is odd indeed. We have discussed the challenges of sexual offences cases in our video Sexual Offences Trials is a reform necessary, which you can find linked in the description below. Of particular note are the shifts in the last two decades on the way investigating and prosecuting authorities see criminal complainants. First, complainants are now referred to as victims and that is from the outset of a report of a criminal complaint. Similarly, the approach taken by police forces is that the starting point when recording a criminal complaint is to believe victims. This latter approach was um, seen as to have originated from a police special notice from 2002 Special Notice 1102, which set out the principles of rape investigation, as stated that it is the policy of the MPS, that's the Metropolitan Police Service, to accept allegations made by the victim in the first instance as being truthful. However, this approach was largely misunderstood as it was taken in an attempt to restore some faith lost back in the days when sexual offences complaints did not see the light of day. This was then taken to an extreme which led the HMIC, the body that inspects the police, in its report of November 2014 titled crime recording making the victim count, which states a paragraph 1.31, crimes can and should be recorded at the first point of contact with the police in all but the most exceptional circumstances. The presumption that the victim should always be believed should be institutionalized. The practice of some forces of investigating first and recording later should be abandoned immediately. 
the present attitude of allowing up to 72 hours before a crime is recorded should be abolished. This approach was rightly um, opposed and heavily criticized by those who pointed out that it completely omits to take into account false allegations. Since then, the debate into sexual offences uh, uh, cases has unfortunately descended into a risky territory, calling for lotto numbers when deciding percentages of false allegations or claims of rape. Some stating that they are a myth and some stating that they are prolific. However, we believe that the debate into sexual offences claims on one hand and false accusations um, leading to wrongful convictions on the other is focusing unnecessarily on trying to estimate the percentage of false allegations, which is unfortunately a difficult one to assess. The crucial aspect is not whether false allegations are prevalent or scarce. What truly matters is their existence. And given the difficulties in discerning those true from those false, extreme caution must be exercised at the outset of the report of a crime. This point was eloquently uh, described by Sir Richard Henriquez in his review of the Metropolitan Police Service's handling of non-recent sexual offences investigations alleged against persons of public prominence, which was commissioned at the wake of the collapse of Operation Midland and is dated 31st of October 2016. At paragraph 1.36, under false complaints, he states, I was concerned at the suggestion made by Chief Constable Bailey that 0.1% of all complaints may be false. That assessment, admittedly off the cuff, bore no relation to my own experience over a lifetime in the courts, nor to my assessment of several complaints during this review. In fact, nobody knows, nor can ever know, the extent of false complaints. It is critical, however, that those charged with the responsibility of investigating crime or instructing others in that process have in mind the real as opposed to the remote possibility that a complaint may be false. Though the report refers um, more specifically to the handling of non-recent sexual offences investigations alleged against persons of public prominence, its findings are capable of extending to other serious offences investigations as they attract similar challenges. Before embarking on a brief summary of Sarah Ricker's report, if you're finding this video interesting so far, please like it and subscribe to our channel to allow our messages to reach other viewers who may be inclined in joining our community. By way of background, and for the small percentage of population that is not aware of it, Operation Midland involved a series of serious sexual offences allegations made by Carl Beach against prominent public figures which lasted from 2014 to 2016. The investigation eventually collapsed and resulted in Carl Beach being prosecuted, convicted and sentenced 
to 18 years imprisonment in 2019. In February 2016, the former Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Lord Hogan Howe, asked retired High Court Judge Sir Richard Enriquez to carry out a review into the Metropolitan Police Service's handling of Operation Midland and other separate investigations into allegations of not recent sexual offences so that the MPS could learn lessons from that review. Sarah Rico's report is dated 21st of October 2016 but was only published by the MPS in 2019. The report was only partially published owing to a duty of confidentiality on the part of the MPS to individual complainants who, unlike Carl Beach, had not been proven in court to have publicated the allegations. However, it is claimed that the recommendations made by Sir Enriquez were published in full. The report's objective can be found at paragraph 1.1 and is said to, to be to identify any lessons for the service and to make recommendations as to how the MPS conducts such investigation in the future. The terms of reference of the review are described at paragraph 1.2. As per the recommendations, the first recommendation made by Sarah Rikas states throughout both the investigative and the judicial process, those who make complaints should be referred to as complainants and not as victims by the MPS. The underlying reasons for this recommendation can be found at paragraphs 112 to 120, in which he summarily states, I have a clear and concluded view. All complainants are not victims. Some complainants are false, and thus those complainants are not victims. Throughout the judicial process, the word complainant is deployed up to the moment of conviction, where after a complainant is properly referred to as a victim. Since the investigative process is similarly engaged in ascertaining facts which will, if proven, establish guilt, the use of the word victim at the commencement of an investigation is simply inaccurate and should be seized. Every accused person that I interviewed expressed the view that by describing his accuser as a victim, his guilt has been assumed and thus prejudged. Secondly, the use of the word is grossly inapt in the case of false complaints. Mr. Belly, in interview, countered this argument by asserting that only 0.1% of all complainants were false and thus any inaccuracy in the use of the word victim is so minimal that can be disregarded. I take considerable issue with that estimate of false complaints and will confront that assertion, assertion in due course. We have already seen what Mr. Enrique's position is. It should be sufficient to say at this stage that since the whole of the investigative process is engaged in the task of collating evidence to determine whether a complaint is true or false, any device which seeks to ignore or minimise that possibility should be put aside. Mr Bailey's argument that removing the word victim and replacing it with complainant will have a significant 
detrimental effect on the trust victims now have in the authorities is necessarily speculative and I believe wrong. I have interviewed as many complainants in my review as I have suspects and have canvassed with every one of them the use of the words victim and complainant. I have found no support amongst them for the use of the word victim, indeed quite the contrary. It is my judgment and that of the complainants that I interviewed that police officers gain the confidence of those who complain of sexual abuse not by the use of false language but by the manner in which complainants are dealt with namely by the response to the initial phone call by an early appointment by being given a, a choice of venue for the meeting a choice of male or female officer by the manner in which a statement is taken by receiving regular information and being part of a highly organized professional process that is fair to both complainant and suspect. The complainants I interviewed did not expect to be instantly believed. They wanted their complaints to be fully and professionally investigated and only then to be believed. They expected the difficult questions and were ready to answer them. Complainants expect to be asked why they did not complain at the time, who saw their injuries, or whether they kept a diary, what has caused them to complain now, and do not anticipate instant belief not to be treated as if the crime is proven before it is even investigated. It is not necessary to set out the dictionary definition of victim to demonstrate how very inappropriate the word is to describe many of those who complain to the police of sexual abuse. Those who continue to condemn for the use of the word are seeking to gain an advantage for complainants at the expense of those accused. The accurate use of language should be fundamental in any criminal justice system process. Sarah Rika's second recommendation states the instruction to believe a victim's account should cease. It should be the duty of an officer interviewing a complainant to investigate the facts objectively and impartially and with an open mind from the outset of the investigation. At no stage must the officer show any form of disbelief and every effort must be made to facilitate the giving of a detailed account in a non-confrontational manner. The underlying reasons for this recommendation can be found particularly in paragraphs 1.24, 1.25 and 1.26 as follows. I spent some considerable time with Operation Hydrant officers discussing this topic. I understand the strategic aim of improving the police service response to complaints of sexual abuse and the aim to make it easier for victims of sexual abuse to make a complaint to the police. The officers steadfastly insist that the victim must be believed during the taking of the statement. I disagree. It is the duty of a police officer to investigate. Many decisions in the criminal justice system process have to be taken on paper. The police officer taking a statement from a complainant has a unique opportunity to assess the complainant's veracity. The effect of requiring a police officer in such a position to believe a complainant 
reverses the burden of proof. It also restricts the officer's ability to test the complainant's evidence. Irish Supreme Court Judge Adrian Hardiman wrote in sexual cases particularly, even very old ones, some people seem inclined to think that there should be a different presumption to the presumption of innocence, that the accuser is to be believed. It is, of course, fundamental in any respectable criminal justice system that no erosion of the presumption of innocence is tolerated. In many allegations of non-recent sexual abuse, the only pieces of evidence are the complaint and the suspect's response. Is the investigating officer required to believe the complainant and then suddenly become objective and impartial as he interviews the suspect? Surely objectivity and impartiality should prevail throughout the whole process. A gentle inquiry at initial interview may result in a critical lead or obviate a possible defence. It may re also result in no further action being taken sooner rather than later. There is plain evidence in cases that I have reviewed that an instruction to believe complainants has overridden a duty to investigate cases objectively and effectively. An instruction to remain objective and impartial whilst interviewing a complainant will not detract from the obligation to support complainants through the criminal justice process, nor deprive any complainant of rights under the victim's charter. It is important that an interviewing officer demonstrates no show of the disbelief at any stage of the interview and that the format of the questioning is non-confrontational. The purpose of the interview is to permit a complainant to give as full and detailed account as possible as part of an impartial fact-finding exercise. At present, the public are told, if you make a complaint, you will be believed. I consider that they should be told, if you make a complaint, we will treat it very seriously and investigate it thoroughly without fear or favour. Chief Constable Bailey and his team have argued, both face to face and on paper, that the March 2016 guidance should remain the stated policy of police forces nationally. Again, I take issue with him. Any policy involving belief of one party necessarily involves disbelief the other party. That cannot be a fair system. Mr Bailey seeks to bolster his argument by speaking and writing of the bad old days when, for many years, victims of abuse had little trust in the police. They were not confident in reporting some of the most horrendous crimes to the very organisations established to protect them. This state of affair was caused by some officers operating within a culture of cynicism and disbelief that was systemic within the police service. Replacing an unsatisfactory state of affair with a flawed system is no solution. And we agree with that. Recommendations 3, 4 and 5 were as follows. Recommendations 3 states, in future the public should be told that if you make a complaint, we will treat it very seriously and investigate it thoroughly without fear or favour. 
we found this to be a leveled and balanced recommendation. In recommendations four, it was said investigators should be informed that false complaints are made from time to time and should not be regarded as a remote possibility. They may be malicious, mistaken, designed to support others, financially motivated or inexplicable. When considering non-recent allegations against prominent people, they should give full consideration to all background information. And recommendation five states, a checklist of critical topics to be covered in the complainant's statement should be made available to all investigators designed specifically for non-recent allegations against prominent people. Critical topics include whether there has been delay in making the complaint, the reason for the delay, whether a claim for compensation has been made and whether there has been any contact with the press. In his response to Sir Enrique's review, Rob Beckley, Assistant Commissioner, in his review into the terminology victim, complainant and believing victims at time of reporting, which is dated February 2018, concluded against the change of the terminology from complainant to victim, mainly on accounts that there is not a better alternative or that it is, is mainly used for the purpose of categorization, ensuring certain services or approaches are applied. At paragraph 4.2, it states, in policing and the law, as in society more widely, terms are often used that put people into a category ensuring certain services or approaches are applied, but not that the guilt or innocence of a person is assumed. And paragraph 4.3 says that in many respects the use complainant is equally problematic. It is a depersonalized, somewhat ugly legalistic word. Many who might be called a complainant vehemently deny any suggestion that they are complaining about what has happened. They are looking for society to put matters right. And then he carried on paragraph 4.6, 4, 4. he says, all the people interviewed were asked if they had an alternative word for either victim or complainant. None of the words suggested, such as injured party, aggrieved or target, as in a person who has been the target of a crime, appear suitable as an alternative. These do not look as convincing reasons to use a misnomer and we reiterate the line taken by Sir Ericus in his comments when he stated that the police service as a critical part of the criminal justice system is under an absolute duty to use accurate language. Since the investigative process is similarly engaged in ascertained facts which will, if proven, establish guilt, the use of the word victim at the commencement of an investigation is simply inaccurate. Those who continue to contend for the use of the word are seeking to gain an advantage for complainants at the expense of the accused. And the, the accurate use of language should be fundamental in any criminal justice process. However, the Commissioner did make a recommendation in line with Sir Rick's recommendation, and that was recommendation three, in which it states, the College of Policing and NPCC, that's the National Police Chiefs Council, should approach 
the Home Office to amend the crime recording counting rules to remove the words, the intention that the victims are believed, to the intention is that victims can be confident they will be listened to and their crime taken seriously. If accepted, the College of Policing APP and training material should be reviewed to support this approach. The Home Office has not adopted this recommendation and the current crime recording rules for frontline officers and staff of 2023-2024, which came into effect in June 2023, states at page 5, the crime recording steps as follows. Step 1. The victim is to be believed. Step 2. On the balance of probability, a crime in law has been committed. And step 3. There is no credible evidence which points to the crime not having been committed. It seems, therefore, that lessons cannot be learned and that reviews are effectively pointless if we continue to make the same mistakes. All the issues highlighted in this video apply to other crimes too. I have taken a few examples of false claims which led to wrongful convictions in case that do not relate to sexual offences to demonstrate the point. The first case is the case of John Porch. Mr Porch was charged with blackmail and assault and was convicted and sentenced to five years imprisonment at Snaresbrook Crown Court in 2016. He appealed this conviction which was finally overturned in 2020 by the Court of Appeal. An article by the Guardian series dated the 3rd of December 2020 reads The judges who outlined their findings in a ruling published on Thursday after a recent Court of Appeal hearing in London were told that Mr Porch had been accused of blackmailing and assaulting an associate said to be responsible for stealing drugs. They concluded that evidence contained in mobile phones messages would have severely undermined the credibility of the men who made complaints against Mr Porch had it been aired at trial. The assumption should not have been made that the seized phones contained nothing of relevance, said Lady Justice Andrews in a written ruling. The second case of Frances Avis. Miss Avis was charged and convicted of harassment and criminal damage following complaints from a neighbour and his wife who claimed that she vandalised their car and threatened to burn their house. They produced letters purportedly to have been written by Miss Avis in which she admitted the threat. Despite her insistent claims of innocence, she was convicted at Bath Magistrates Court in February 2016. She was sentenced to 24 months suspended sentence. She immediately appealed and her conviction was quashed at Bristol Crown Court in August 2016 after proving that the threatening letters were in fact written by the complainants themselves. An article by the Daily Mail reads that this conviction costs Miss Avis her job and she then became the victim of abuse herself by other neighbours. The complainant, Mr Webb, was subsequently charged with four counts of perverting the course of justice to which he pleaded guilty. Another case, the case of Jamie Snedden. 
Jamie Snedden was charged and convicted of unlawful wounding and sentenced to 21 month imprisonment at Croydon Crown Court in December 2000. He served 10 months in prison but his conviction was finally quashed in 2009 after his accused Mr James, a former magistrate, admitted to have lied. Lady Justice Hallett said that the case depended to a large extent on the word of James. Of the conviction and his time in prison, Mr Snedden says, it was awful. At the time, I contemplated suicide. And the case of Jonathan Price. Mr Price was charged and convicted with wounding with intent and attempting to cause grievous bodily harm. The accusation rests solely on the testimony of two men. Mr Price was sentenced to 12 years in prison. It later transpired that the two men in fact lied and sought compensation from Mr Price's family to change their account on appeal. Mr Price spent two years in prison before his conviction was eventually quashed. According to an article on Wales Online, one of the men said that he didn't realise how serious he was, but once the police became involved, he felt he had no other choice but to lie to the police and to carry it through to the Court of Appeal. These instances vividly demonstrate the incorrectness labelling a complainant as a victim and more importantly highlight the potential consequences of adopting a believe the victim perspective such as overlooking necessary inquiries or omitting crucial steps to validate the veracity of criminal complaints. They also reinforce the essential need for consistent treatment of all cases, emphasising comprehensive and thorough investigations during the initial stages to ascertain the credibility of each allegation. I hope you found this video interesting and if so please like it and subscribe to our channel to be part of our community and to help us on our mission to humanize wrongful convictions. Also join our networking hub at spokeninjustice.net to have your say as to the future content of this channel. Join us again next week. We look forward to usher you as we sit and rise in this unique trial.